Welcome again. Um, I'm introducing myself again, Giovanna Vio. Um, I am one of the um, co-leads of the CAFAG Task Force of the Alliance for Child Protection. And I'm currently um, consulting um, on a long-term consultancy with UNICEF, um, working on children associated with armed forces and armed groups or CAFAG. So I'm very happy to be here today to facilitate this um, session on accountability to children in armed conflict. And thank you very much for joining. So um, first of all, I'd like to introduce my co-facilitator for this session, Camilla Jones, who is also one of the co-coordinators of the Alliance for Child Protection. Um, you will see her um, coming up. Uh, shortly as she will be helping us with uh, with the main team but um, I'm going to introduce the speakers very soon um, but um, I would like to first frame the session in in the broader uh, picture of this event um, as I'm sure many of you know accountability is a strategic priority number one of the four key strategic priorities within the Alliance for Child Protection Strategy for 2021 and 2025. Okay. And we can go to the next slide, please. Um, and in line, so these are all the, this is like the at a glance strategy for um, the, the new one, the 2021-2025. And please, uh, next slide. In line with the strategic priority on accountability, all humanitarian programs are accountable to children and need to ensure their meaningful um, and equitable participation. This is what it reads. And in practice, please next slide. Um, we know that this may mean um, a number of things for organizations or for partners who want to promote accountability to children. For example, it might mean um, promoting um, accountability to children um, through meaningful actions to ensure that children are really involved in and in, in the in the design and implementation of humanitarian programs from the start or it might mean strengthening the capacity of those who would like to adopt child-friendly and child-led um, accountability procedures. So in this session that I have the pleasure to facilitate, we will listen to three organizations um, who in different ways uh, will tell us how they have approached the topic of accountability to children within their work. So let me introduce the speakers and topics for today. Um, first of all, we have Dr. Catherine Bailey Abidi and Madeline Zat from the Dallaire Institute, who will talk to us about their checklist on children, peace and security. Um, followed by Sandra Magnon from Plan International, who will explain how safe participation of CAFA can be embedded in the design of programs. And um, finally, last but not least, uh, Mrs. Sharon Riggle from the Office of the Special Representatives for the Secretary General on Children and Armed Conflict, who will talk to us about the um, practical guidance for mediators to protect children in situations of armed conflict, which our office has um, developed. So um, a warm welcome to our speakers today, and we very much look forward to listening to you. Um, before um, we proceed, I would like to um, and, and give floor to our speakers. I would like to launch a short poll um, through Menti, and I will let Camilla take over briefly for to do that. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Giovanna, for that very warm introduction to, to the session and to the speakers. So um, Menti is a, a really nice tool for polling participants and kind of gathering your inputs. If you want to, you can use it on your phone, if you also have a phone device, or you can click through um, on your browser as well. Um, the producers will just pop it, pop the link into the chat box now. Uh, our mentee question to you is, what does accountability to children in armed conflict look like for you? So we'd like you to just brainstorm. It gives us a good idea of what people are thinking. If you're not quite sure, feel free to write what you think it might look like and obviously we'll explore it over the course of the session but it just gets us uh, to have a bit of a um, sense check of, of the room and what people are thinking when they join this session um, and that will help the speakers to frame their uh, interventions and also help us when we join the, the breakout rooms and the Q&A later on so I can see uh, at least one person's uh, worked out how to launch the mentee and add their comment 
And I think, Gio, while they fill it in, I was going to hand back to you and then we'll come back to the mentor results later. Yes, absolutely. We'll, um, we'll let our um, audience here to reflect uh, for a minute or two. Um, and in the meantime, I would like to give you maybe a quick overview of the session today. So after this um, small mentee, we will start by listening to our three speakers who will be presenting their topics for 30 minutes, which is um, 10 minutes each. We will then take a, a very short break, five minutes just to stretch. And this will be followed by group work in breakout rooms. So there'll be three. And I will explain again later for those who need uh, interpretation. And um, the last part of our session will be a panel discussion and Q&A for about 20, 25 minutes, depending on where we are, um, where the speakers will be able to um, answer some of your questions. So um, talking about questions, as you know, you listen and you listen to the presentations, please um, feel free to write your questions in the chat box and we will try to capture them and, um, and we'll do our best to answer them all um, at the end. Um, so I'm seeing the, the menti getting slowly populated, which is great. And we'll just wait a couple of minutes um, as we, we have until just a few minutes to three, so. Yeah, when the mentee fills up, it sort of scrolls up and down. So it's quite nice. Like your flip chart gets longer when you're uh, in these big uh, online meetings, uh, your virtual flip chart. Um, yeah, you've got to be keen before it disappears to see what's, uh, what's being said. So far, what I've uh, noted is some key buzzwords of sort of justice, prevention, protection, impact and making sure that we achieve it empowerment participation being heard despite challenges um, feedback mechanisms which obviously need to be very well tailored for this particular population group do no harm um, anything else you're spotting there giovanna i have to say it's quite, it's quite small for me i haven't got my glasses on so. <laughs> Menti goes like so fast. It's just it like does. Adjusted, but um, what um, we can do is we could also ask the producers a lot of to... that I suspect will come out in our presentation. So um, yeah, so we can ask the producers to share the results. I think in the chat, so that we can all review it if we want to as well. Thanks. Fantastic. <laughs> I see. We can give maybe another extra minute, and then we we can start with our presenters. Lots on feedback mechanisms, which we had a session on this morning. Um, for some of you, it might have been too early in the morning, but some really solid examples of feedback mechanisms in the Middle East and Asia were shared. Yeah. And there's also um, someone is mentioning prevention and remedy to serious violations so, um, of, of international humanitarian law, which um, um, I'm sure will be um, addressed. Uh, in one of the presentations as well and um, yeah it all seems that actually the people who are um, participating today are all very equipped to then participate in their interesting and rich discussions in the breakout rooms because these are very um, thoughtful um, points that are reflected in this uh, in this mentee so Yes, very pleased to see that. Okay, so I think we can just, uh, we can keep this um, and then you'll be able to um, to continue seeing it, clicking um, the link provided in the chat box. So um, if we're ready, I think we can um, start by introducing our first presenters. So I'll just give it a second to go back to our um, slide deck. Yes, so um, the next one, please. So today, our first speakers are um, our colleagues from the Daler Institute, Dr. Catherine Bailey Abidi and Madeline Zat, who will be presenting the Children, Peace and Security um, Checklist. So Catherine and Madeline, um, you have about 10 minutes for this presentation. Um, and I will just flag when you have two minutes um, and one minute left. So um, over to you. Very glad to have you here. Thanks. Thank you very much, Giovanna. 
So welcome, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone joining us today. Before we get started, I just want to acknowledge that Madeline and I are joining you from Mi'kmaq, which is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And as we get started with our presentation on accountability, I'd really like for everyone to reflect on where you're located and your, the relationship with that land and its ancestral peoples and traditional peoples. So Madeline and I are joining you from Dallaire Institute for Children, Peace and Security. And we're going to share with you our checklist, our policy checklist, which is intended to prioritize children and an accountability mechanism working with state partners to prioritize children, their protection and their prevention in recruitment. Our organization was founded by General Romeo Dallaire based on his experiences during the Rwanda genocide where he saw so many children engaged in violence and also the manifestation and the impacts of that um, courageous abuse of children's rights. Our vision at the Dallaire Institute is a world where children are at the heart of peace and security. And our intention is to not only prevent the recruitment of children into violence, but to transform these cycles of violence. And that's why we're invested and focused on prevention and accountability to and with children. We have three main approaches for how we conduct our work. The first is focused on advocacy. So working with many partners here um, in the session today to advance policy and frameworks to protect children, to engage children in peace building and to prevent their recruitment. We have training programming and capacity building with security sector colleagues around the world. So we're looking at enhancing skills related to prevention. And then finally, we do research, and our research is really driven to be innovative, prevention-oriented, and to look at how early we can create systems and practices to prevent children's engagement in violence. So I'm going to invite my colleague Madeline to come into the session and share our checklist. Um, this will be the first time we're presenting our checklist, so we certainly invite critique recommendations to help us advance and improve this, this policy checklist. Thanks, Madeline, over to you. Thanks so much, Catherine. Thank you so much, Giovanna and Camilla for convening the session and welcome to all of you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. So I'm going to be talking a little bit more in detail we need not only to protect children from grave violations during armed conflict, but also to understand the fragile context that threaten the protection of children and make them susceptible to these grave violations in the first place. As child protection practitioners, we have a responsibility to protect children, but we also have a responsibility to create the conditions that allow them to reach their full potential. Children cannot reach their full potential if their viewpoints are not heard and if their perspectives are not included in the decisions that directly affect them. Being accountable to children means viewing them as agents of meaningful change instead of viewing them only as perpetrators or victims of violence. This is why over the past couple of years, the Dallaire Institute has been advocating for a global children peace and security agenda. New frameworks and approaches are desperately needed to provide platforms to put a priority on the protection of children from their recruitment and use in violence, and to understand how this is central to the attainment of peace and security globally. If you could go to the next slide, please. The Dallaire Institute, as Catherine mentioned, uh, just recently published a children peace and security policy checklist, which includes a list of 10 tangible actions that governments and leaders can take to implement and contribute to a global agenda for children, peace and security. You'll see on this slide here, this is a, a brochure that we put together to give you all um, the checklist as, at a glance. Um, it is a much longer document. This just gives you kind of a snapshot of, of the policy checklist. So as you can see from the slide, items on the checklist include steps that governments can take to support the development of a UN Security Council resolution on a children, peace and security agenda. Ensure that, um, that government ministries have national mandates which set out their roles and responsibilities in upholding such an agenda. Ensure that domestic legislation aligns with international obligations on children, peace and security. Ensure that national security, defense policy and foreign policy prioritize children's protection. 
make sure that financial targets are set for children, peace and security agenda resourcing. Prioritize the intersectional perspectives of children in building and upholding this global agenda. Work with civil society to better understand the gaps in current global policy with respect to children. And finally, design monitoring and evaluation mechanisms to effective, effectively measure the impact of a global children, peace and security agenda. I do want to highlight that a critical step in building this agenda together is recognizing that children are not a homogenous group. They have unique and distinct identities and vulnerabilities, and these differences affect the challenges that they face. As we move forward, it's essential that we as a global community, and especially as child protection practitioners, adopt an intersectional approach to children. The recommendations that you see on the slide here include, are, sorry, are in no way exhaustive, uh, but they are meant to create dialogue and catalyze action. And we hope that this checklist will help guide our collective efforts to build a global peace and security agenda. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Catherine and Madeleine. Um, this was really interesting. And I'm sure um, um, I, I was very intrigued to read about the policy checklist. And uh, I'm sure that more, um, a lot of interesting discussions will um, come up in the um, breakout rooms. I know that you're keen to um, also get uh, some feedback and to really um, sense what um, our audience today has to say about it, what they see, um, you know, its relevance and how they can apply it in their own um, work um, as field practitioners. So um, we, uh, we're now moving on to the next presentation for today. So uh, I would like to introduce um, our next speaker, um, Sandra, Sandra Mignan uh, from Plan International, who is also my um, colleague, co-lead um, at the, the CAFAC Task Force. And Sandra will talk to us about um, how to ensure safe participation of children associated with armed forces and armed groups in program design. Sandra, over to you. You also have 10 minutes. Um, I didn't need to do it, but I will flag at two minutes um, uh, to keep us on time. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Joanna. So um, today I'm going to talk about the safe participation of CAFAG in uh, program design. So next slide, please. So the CAFAG task force has developed a CAFAG program development toolkit. And then if you attended the Heart of the Press uh, session earlier, you heard uh, Giovanna talking about it. So this toolkit includes um, the main uh, the main resources. So we have some guidelines on how to design programs for CAFAG. And we have also a training package uh, that accompanies the guidelines and that includes PowerPoint um, and handouts. So as you can see, the toolkit follows the project cycle steps. And um, child participation is present throughout the toolkit. But today I would like to talk a bit more and focus on the involvement of former CAFAG during the context analysis, which is the second step of the, of the cycle. And this is uh, the step with the context analysis where we document the situation to then inform program design. So this is the very first step where we try to understand what is happening in our country and where we can involve children in understanding the situation so that we can develop programs that respond to their needs. And but what we've seen in developing this toolkit and also um, with all the consultation we've done is that very often uh, children and particularly CAFAG are not involved in project design. And this is because child protection actors are very well aware of the risk of doing harm. And as a result, they tend to shy away from involving children. So rather than you know, risking doing harm, we rather just stay away and say, let's not involve children because we're not sure if we uh, may do any harm. But the result of that 
is that we are not engaging children. We and, and children actually they know what they need. They know how they feel about the situation. They know their the challenges they're facing, and and how they would like to be engaged. So if we don't engage children from the beginning. Then we may completely miss uh, the point. We may be blind to their actual needs. And what you will see in this presentation is, is how to engage children, but also some of the results of uh, this engagement in, in the countries where we have tested the tools uh, last year. Next slide. So the methodology um, that we are using is um, a workshop methodology. And so uh, this workshop is, uh, is part of the context analysis. We call it CAFAG consultation. And this involves CAFAG or boys and girls um, between 13 and 17 years old um, through a, a workshop. These are three half days workshop, but it's important that it's half day so that it gives time to children to relax between the sessions, to reflect as well. And during those sessions, boys and girls have time to, um, to reflect on general questions. So we don't ask any personal questions. And uh, they're all organized around participatory activities. We're using games, uh, but not in a competition mode. So it's really done in a way where children can express their ideas, but it's not done where we are competing against each other. Um, and so during this workshop, we ask children their perspective on the risk factors of recruitment, but also the protective factors. So what can we, uh, what are the factors that can prevent their recruitment? Uh, which is another way also of looking at, at prevention. We ask them um, how we can facilitate their release from armed forces and armed groups. We ask the challenges that they face during their reintegration. And also the, what it means to them to be reintegrated. And, and this last point is, is very crucial. And then we, we are getting very interesting data from, from that one. It's basically asking children's perspective on what it means to them to be successfully reintegrated. You know, we often have, as practitioners, an idea like child who is reintegrated should be, you know, X, Y, and Z. But we never really ask children, like, from your perspective, what is important? And so we ask them to list all those attributes of successful reintegration and then to, um, and then to prioritize these attributes, like what are the most important ones? And then these attributes can then be used um, for programming. And then we ask them how we can support uh, that process for, for the successful reintegration. Next slide, please. Um, so now I'd like to tell you about some of the results. So we have tested these tools in two countries, at Central African Republic and Iraq. And in Central African Republic, the context analysis that we implemented there uh, was implemented with hundreds of community members. Like it was really wide. Uh, why context analysis? It was in almost the entire country where we asked them questions about the, the reasons for recruitment, their perspective of children uh, associated with armed forces and armed groups who are coming back to the community. And we you know, documented a lot of information. And then we implemented this one workshop with boys and girls uh, formerly recruited. And there are the information we collected for that one workshop where it's just so incredible. And then the quality and the detail of data we collected, like largely outweighed basically the data we collected for these hundreds of key informant interviews and, and uh, focus group discussions. Um, and obviously this is a different perspective. One, when we're asking about the perspective of community members, but when we ask children perspective, what the, the data we were collected were really different. 
And I'd like just to share some of the results. Of course, I uh, can't share the whole report, but uh, for example, on the risk factors to recruitment, the girls mention the lack of training centers, the lack of education opportunities, of access to food and toiletries, as well as the sexual exploitation uh, that they were facing in their communities as risk factors to their recruitment. Boys mention watching more movies, um, drug abuse, and the lack of parental support, among other things. Of course, there is like a, a longer list, but I felt I thought this these things were interesting to mention. And the idea of collecting this data is to then identify those risk factors that we can consider to develop prevention programs. So addressing these risk factors will contribute to the prevention of recruitment. We also ask them obstacles to their exit of armed forces and armed groups. And here the, the children mentioned something very specific. They talked about the respect. When they are within those armed groups, they feel respected. They feel respected as the wife of the chef, as um, because they have responsibilities, they're driving cars. Girls also mentioned that they receive the nitty kits. They receive the means to manage their menstruation by armed groups. And they know that when they will go back to their communities, they will no longer have access to, to these um, items, to the toiletries, or they won't be respected. They won't be acknowledged the same way they are in those armed groups. So again, like very interesting information to uh, inform programming before the start. You know, often we collect this data once we have started programming, but here the idea is to do that before. Um, next slide, please. In Iraq, we also collected interesting data on how to support the reintegration of children in their community. And their children highlighted something very specific. They said, we need psychosocial support, which, you know, we, we can expect. But they said, we need that psychosocial support for us, but also for parents and for friends. Because we know that like this, then they have also needs. And with this way, they will better be able to support us. So I found that very interesting. The other point is um, the attributes of successful reintegration. And there they mentioned community acceptance, having a certificate, feeling supported by their family, having access to economic support and legal protection. And by that, they meant owning legal documents. And we know that in Iraq, this is one of the main challenges of these children. So these are attributes that then can be used to define the criteria of successful reintegration indicators. So, um, right, so that when you develop indicators on reintegration, then you can say, why well, for successful reintegration, this means those five items are actually filled. Right, so I think I've reached my time, so thank you. And then if you're interested to know more, you can follow me in the breakout room afterwards where we can talk about the measures to reduce the risk of harm. Thank you very much, Sandra. And um, yes, indeed, you'll be able to um, go more in depth in your discussions with participants, um, if they please. And also um, just to remind participants to um, to write their questions in the in the chat box and um, we'll be um, addressing those, hopefully all of them um, at the end uh, in the Q&A. So now um, um, I'm very happy to introduce our next and last speaker for the day, um, Mrs. Uh, Sharon Riggle from the Office of the Special Representative for the Secretary General on Children and Armed Conflict. Um, and um, Mrs. Riggle, um, Sharon, you will talk to us about the practical guidance for mediators to protect children in um, situations of armed conflict. Um, over to you, you have ten, a, a bit more than 10 minutes as uh, our colleagues at Dallaire were <laughs> Uh, that left us a couple. So um, yeah, I will just uh, um, flag at two minutes after time. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Giovanna. 
Uh, and, uh, and thank you to the other speakers too. After listening to those presentations, I wanna join the breakout groups with Sandra and with Madeline. Those are, uh, I really appreciated. Uh, this is really great. I like how practical we're being too on, on all of this. So I love the checklist and the package that Madeline gave us and the, uh, and the package that Sandra presented. Uh, I hope we uh, stay in touch on this. So um, we're being practical. I don't have a, a slideshow. Um, I'm a bit of a you know troglodyte when it comes to these types of things. I tend to just talk, uh, and uh, I'll try to I'll try to make it interesting. Um, so we're being practical, and we're talking about tools. So we will be I will be talking about the practical guidance for mediators, um, but we have. I also wanted to show the CAC mandate um, as a tool, and we also have a new one that really dovetails with what Sandra was just talking about, which is our Nairobi process um, that people seem to be interested in. So I'm gonna talk about all three of those. Um, at, uh, at first, um, I wanted to talk about really, uh, and also if I could call on either Anne or Federica or somebody from my office to put the link to the mediation guidance in the chat, I think that would be uh, useful as well. So I'm going to focus more on the on the why than the what uh, for the guidance, and because you can read that for yourselves, and I think um, you know it's 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 really quite relevant to these discussions. So I wanted to talk first about our mandate, and we're talking about accountability, and we're talking about prevention, which you know our office is doing. Um, which you may know our office is doing more and more of too, focusing on how do we uh, help with the work that we already do, how does that contribute to prevention? How can we be a, um, a uh, uh, an envoy for um, prevention, a, what's the word I'm looking for? Advocate would be the word for uh, looking for it. How can we do that better? So the whole mandate was created and I, I think everybody here is familiar with, generally with, with our mandate, but it was created also as a prevention tool to, it was created, we're in our 25th anniversary year this year. So we've just issued a big study, which hopefully all of you have seen looking back over the very interesting and very diverse 25 years that our mandate has been in existence. And, and it was created initially just on the recruitment and use violation. But as you know, now we have six grave violations, which is the recruitment and use killing and maiming, rape and other forms of sexual violence, abduction, attacks on schools and hospitals, and denial of humanitarian assistance. Um, sadly, these are as relevant today as they were 25 years ago, but we are getting better, uh, both within our mandate and as an international community and domestically on how to tackle, tackle all of these. The idea is if we do it well, it can help prevent violations in future. So, I, uh, we have, uh, and again, briefly touching on this because I believe most of us are familiar with the mandate, but we have you know, the monitoring and reporting mechanism and our listing in the annual report and our action plans as very significant tools to both increase accountability, but also increase um, prevention. The MRM, as you know, um, works through UN uh, entities on the ground to uh, collect and verify information, which then gets sent through to the Security Council and others um, for action. And this happens on a quarterly basis, which not everybody knows, um, in order that this information is fresh and actionable, because we're talking about children. Um, the annual report gets all of, the, all of the glitz and glamor in the news once a year, but of course that comes out often six months after the year um, previously has ended. So there's a quarterly reporting as well that goes to the Security Council um, for action. We also have our listing mechanism, which everybody here must be familiar with. It is one of our uh, more famous uh, uh, tools in our toolbox. And of course we list uh, perpetrators in the annual report of the Secretary General to the Security Council, which names both um, member state entities, you know, security services, um, as, well as, uh, as well as armed groups. And I am remembering we have interpretation. Uh, so I'm, I, I always get the interpreter saying, please slow down. So I'll try to, I'll try to slow down. 
So we have also um, non-state actors and regardless of whether they've been designated as a terrorist group, we are allowed to engage our mandate um, almost uniquely in the UN is allowed to engage anybody who appears in that list, regardless if they have a designation uh, or not. Um, it, of course, it depends on who wants to talk to us. We, we are allowed to, but not everybody is, uh, has decided that the cost benefit analysis is in their favor uh, to engage with us. Um, but um, these tools that I've, uh, I've uh, talked about are both you know, immediate, but then also longer term because we have the, uh, we have the um, action plans, which many of you know, uh, engage these parties that appear in the list uh, and the annexes of the Secretary General's report, which look at sustainable long-term change with an aim to prevention, because we're aiming at behavior change. Um, we we look at uh, we include all six grave violations in every action plan now, regardless of which violation the party is listed for. We also. Uh, uh, ask the party if it's a state to issue command orders down the chain, include age verification mechanisms, um, and of course, you know, releasing all children under 18 uh, immediately. Uh, and there are, are, there are other elements as well, but this contributes to both the immediate as well as the, as well as the longer term. So um, we have the, so that is the international accountability and domestic accountability. We also multiply what we do by working with others. Uh, I'm looking here in my notes about, for example, the ICC has now a policy on children, which we contributed to in 2016. Um, we have international accountability mechanisms, but of course, like I mentioned, uh, we also are concerned with domestic um, uh, accountability, including criminal prosecution of, of perpetrators. So without this, uh, uh, and also I wanted to add in here, um, accountability down the chain. So we have to hold ourselves accountable too. So, and I think that's what this session is really targeting is how can we be more accountable to helping these children in the best possible way? Um, so it has to be all up and down the chain. We need buy-in from the children themselves. And I just arrived less than 24 hours ago from South Sudan and Kenya, where we were uh, in South Sudan, really speaking to a lot of directly to a lot of children and implementers there. And I can talk about that in a second, but uh, we need that buy-in buy from the people we're trying to help all the way up the chain to the international community. So I think that's part of our checklist is to look to see how are we incorporating every level into our actions. Um, um, okay, so I'm gonna also talk about the, um, the mediation guidance. Um, many of you have read this. I'm not sure, I know we have experts on the panel here. I'm not sure who our you know, 55 uh, participants are. Uh, but uh, hopefully most of you have read and seen the practical guidance for mediators uh, that our office created in consultation throughout the UN system uh, with NGOs and internationally. We had international, okay, international um, uh, consultations as well. I'm going to go quickly. I just got the two minute post it. Okay, so the international guidance focuses on the sixth grade violations as well as detention of children, um, clearly getting children into the peace process, their voice into the peace process is important, as well as the final uh, documents. It is also a confidence building measure. It's not only a humanitarian imperative, but a confidence building measure. It's often an entry point for discussions on more difficult parts in the in the in the negotiations. Um, so we need to include ch children's issues as well um, as their as their voices, and that's with ceasefire agreements, cessation of hostilities, security arrangements, governance, and transitional justice. Okay, so we Federica has put the uh, link in the chat. You can read that. Uh, briefly on the Nairobi process, and that's a 30 second hit. Um, we, and I can share that concept note, we have uh, created a, uh, uh, a network of around 12 to 15 national NGOs in 
conflict in former conflict countries, all of whom used to be or are currently on the CAC agenda, um, and are working with NGOs there to hold consultations, symbolic, not comprehensive consultations with um, uh, former CAFAG, as well as communities and others that have um, a view on reintegration. We are very much trying to do exactly what Sandra was just saying, um, which is to get the voices of these children into our work in a more systematic way. So what we are doing is we are uh, asking for recommendations from each of these country consultations, which will be combined and uh, presented in Nairobi in December, as it stands now in December, um, to the international community. And we invite all of you to take part uh, in that. Um, interestingly, it is stakeholder led. I say notably, it's stakeholder led. Uh, so we are following them, uh, what they would like to do, these groups, and how they would like to present, as well as we, no money has changed hands. So all of these groups are doing this uh, from existing funds, or one or two may have uh, fundraised for to hold the consultations, but this is being done because they believe in it and because we believe in it. We don't have, uh, you know, much, uh, re many resources as well dedicated to it at the moment, but it is absolutely fascinating. Uh, I'm happy to talk to you um, more about that. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. So I don't know who we have. In so we still have a lot of people, which, you know, I don't know if this means that you know, people have gone off and are doing laundry or if they're really interested in what we have to say in this. <laughs> but anyways, we have uh, we have 35 people, which is fantastic. You could ignore um, anyone with an underscore because they're part of our production team. You've got about eight participants in the room. Oh, wow. OK, thank you. That's an impressive production team. So, OK, so we've got eight. OK, that's very manageable. Thank you so much. Um, so um, is there any way to see who we have uh, in the room? So you can uh, press on view, uh, uh, top right. All right, I see now, uh, and you can select without the underscores. Gallery, maybe, and you should yep. be able to see. Um, yep. And then there's Federica from my office That's and right. other interpreters. Uh, Manuela, Matt, Justine, Jonas, Elsa, Elizabeth. Okay, uh, Anissa. Okay, um, so um, these are the questions. It's it's focused on mediation, but I think because we are you know just eight or nine people, um, we can anything. I think that was talked about in the in the discussion today. Um, we can talk about. Um, I've been involved in. Just to give you an idea, I've been involved in mediation processes um, as well as I've um, uh, trained uh, others on mediation and negotiation. Um, and I'm very happy to uh, I'm very happy to uh, discuss any aspects of that. I think one of the things I didn't get a uh, I didn't get a chance to you know, really expand on was the um, the the issue of children in mediation can be multifaceted because one of the obstacles we face is um, children just fall down that list of priorities. They get negotiated out for other things. It's absolutely uh, the most difficult thing to include them meaningfully in a peace discussion or a peace agreement. Um, so we have to convince those with the power to include them that it's useful. Um, we can make the humanitarian arguments, which of course we do, um, but we can also make the uh, peace and security arguments, which, which um, appeal to a different group maybe. So we have different groups that need to be appealed to. We can talk about um, uh, instability, um, losing a generation that's uh, that's going to be brought up in conflict. We can talk about reintegration, um, but also children, and I saw this in the Columbia example, can be used as a confidence building measure. It can be used as to, to unblock a process that is fraught, and of course, most of them are. Um, so that's also another aspect that we could we could have a chat about here. 
Um, but why don't we hear about your experiences too? Uh, has anybody here been involved uh, in a in a mediation or participated or contributed? And feel free just to unmute yourselves and jump right in. And or on you know video, turn on your video as well. We're happy to see you. Um, yeah, it would be great if everybody wanted to, you know. Uh, open their cameras. Let me see, Is it, do we have anybody? No. Uh, not yet. Um, not yet. How about you, Federica? You're brave. She's from my <laughs> office. I'm happy to jump in, but I unfortunately don't have much experience in uh, including child protection language directly in mediation or peace processes. So <laughs> I unfortunately don't have any uh, first-hand experience. But I hope that other participants might have uh, more. And I think we can use, um, I think this question was captured because, um, um, you know, we have to sort of like take something out of the topic and suggest it. But, you know, as, as mentioned yeah. earlier, we don't need to stick to it at all. And if we want to, I assume that um, um, like, colleagues like who are here I want to ask maybe questions directly to Sharon to expand on some of the points uh, presented in her presentation so that can can I can I call on uh, Simon um he's uh, turned bravely turned on his his video uh <laughs> and we'd love to hear from you would you like to would you like Hi, to okay <laughs> Hi, Simon. Si effectivement au fait euh, j'ai envie de dire quelque chose par rapport à la protection des enfants Indeed, I want to say something about child protection in CAR, especially, uh, sorry, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, especially in the Kivu region. We are involved in accompanying children protection organizations in order to negotiate for child protection that are involved in armed groups. These groups are very active and they are using children. Lastly, actually last year, we accompanied the MONISCO to sign some agreements with the, the armed groups in the Kivu agreements. This was done as part of child protection with non-state stakeholders. This is what we are doing for child protection and negotiation to protect children. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Can I also ask you what challenges you faced during this process because this is not easy to negotiate with armed groups why should not they why shouldn't they use children and protect them instead the challenges related to this yes it's right at first it's not easy to establish a contact with the armed groups but what we do is as part of projects to involve the communities. So in each village, when we received red flags, we created networks, community networks to protect children. And these networks uh, allow us to gather some information. If we want to aim at these armed groups, we need to talk to the managers of these community groups for child protection. And this is because some of these up group members do communicate with the communities. This is when we started to use the MONISCO. And as soon as we established contact with these groups, 
we can work with international NGOs and we can build trust and we can move to the next step of these agreements. If this armed group accepts, then sometimes they free the children that were still active in their groups. Thank you very much, Simon. This is very interesting to hear that we can educate people. The interpretation turned on here. So just to, I'm just going to have a quick, for those who didn't uh, hear, uh, he says one of the one of the challenges they work with MINUSCO to uh, uh, get the children out of these groups. Uh, MINUSCO in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, they had it's a, it's the challenges are it's difficult to contact the groups, but they've also worked through the communities, some of whom actually worked with the armed groups, to um, collaborate with them and build their confidence uh, and uh, convince them that these children should be released and then. Uh, often um, they are, the armed groups will often release them. So that was uh, from the ground. Uh, they also work in the, in the Kivus in the, in the East. Um, and they just recently signed, uh, helped MNUSCO in the signing of agreements um, uh, with, with these groups. So uh, successful engagement. So thank you. Um, Sharon, do, apologies yes. for stepping yes. in. Um, uh, the timing got a little bit, we got a bit delayed with everything. So we need to actually go back all to plenary and some of the, I think the other um, groups have. Yes, we're all back now. Uh, yeah. so. Let's go. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we'll be moving on to the questions. So um, I think that in everyone in um, from the different breakout rooms will be now, um, will have an opportunity maybe to ask the questions they were not able to ask. Um, and I don't know if it's just me, but it felt like the time flew by and we didn't really have uh, much left to go into the discussions. But um, so uh, we have, it's 15.50, uh, we need to finish on time. So we've, we've got another 20 minutes to um, to ask a few questions to our speakers today. And um, we have a couple of um, pre um, uh, questions that um, Camilla and I wanted to ask, and then we will also uh, read out the ones that participants have been um, writing in the chat box. So um, the first question we had was for um, our colleagues at, I guess it's for Catherine, Catherine would it be both of you answering, um, our colleagues at the lair? So um, we wanted to know how, in your opinion, can um, a children and peace, and peace and security agenda be used to fill um, some of the critical gaps that remain unaddressed by other peace and security agendas and rights frameworks? Um, so any thoughts you can share on that. Also, if you want to share anything that has come out of the um, breakout room discussion, feel free. Um, we have about three minutes for, for your answer. So over to you, Catherine or Madeline. So Ka Catherine, I can go ahead and start and then um, feel free to, to add anything. So thank you so much, Giovanna, for that question. It's a great question. So this, Part of the reason why we developed this checklist was to fill these gaps. We, we wanted to, to highlight the fact that children are not only victims and perpetrators of violence, but they are agents of, of positive change. Um, and so really kind of putting a spotlight on the agency of children was a big focus for us. And when we were designing this checklist, it we had many, many conversations about how this checklist and this, hopefully, what will come out of this is a UN Security Council resolution on children, peace, and security. This is not something that will compete with other frameworks. It's really designed to complement these other frameworks. And we, we have done a lot of work. We have a Youth Advisory Council here at the Dallaire Institute. And we actually, tomorrow, as part of the um, Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, we have a side event that we're putting together where some of our members of our Youth Advisory Council are going to be presenting this checklist and, and giving their own perspectives from their own experiences on how youth can engage to really move this agenda forward. 
And we see youth as being a very important part to advancing this global peace and global children peace and security agenda by giving voice to, to children and to their protection. So we really see uh, the youth peace and security agenda and the children peace and security agenda um, working hand in hand. So Catherine, over to you if you wanna add anything. Hard to add to that, Madeline. That was a great uh, response. Perhaps just to say that when we did our large mapping of the various frameworks that exist, we found a lot of opportunity to strengthen protection and participation of children. And in particular, when we looked at security sector uh, reform and other mechanisms, children were just invisible to the process. So early warning of conflict, there are no indicators that we are aware of that recognize children as being essential to peace and security. So we saw a lot of gaps and a real need to strengthen and fill those, those voids. And that was the sort of culmination is this checklist. But behind this checklist was a rather comprehensive assessment of the current frameworks that exist. And we recognized the need based on all of Madeline's prior comments. So it was an important, it's an important addition to what we already have to strengthen protection. That's great. And I'm sure that the other speakers, I see Sharon like nodding as well, will have, uh, you know, will be happy to also, you know, exchange notes. And I'm sure you've done that in consultation also with their office. But uh, there's certainly a lot of over overlapping and complementarity in all of this. Um, there's certainly space as well for uh, the, the checklist to actually um, fill some of the of the gaps that um, are out there. So that's great. Thank you very much for uh, presenting that. And I hope you got um, at least um, a flavor of some of the feedback that you um, you wanted to have uh, through the group work but um, if not I'm sure that people will be able to get in touch with you and uh, we'll be sharing the contacts um, at the end. Um, so now I'd like to um, I have two more questions one for Sandra one for um, uh, Sharon so um, to Sandra I wanted to ask um, as Sandra has been leading on the development of the CAFA toolkit um, as, as you know, and she's the main uh, also, and uh, she's really followed the whole process. So I would like to ask her um, uh, to expand a little bit on her presentation today and to uh, perhaps talk a bit more about um, what the particular risks uh, are to take into consideration when, when we engage uh, children in program design. Um, and I'm sure you've, oh, this was also part of the discussion um, in the breakout room. So if anything has come out, Sandra, that you'd like to share, um, please do, do, do say here. Yeah, thank you. Yes, there are, there are some risks and that's why we conduct a risk assessment before we even think about organizing a workshop with uh, children. So we bring all the actors around the table, think about all the potential risk uh, this and then identify risk mitigation measures. Uh, this uh, risk assessment is then reviewed by security officers as well from various organizations to make sure we haven't left anything out. And um, so, and then if we basically feel like the risk is too high, then we would not organize a workshop and, and often gathering children. So particularly if they're at risk of detention or at risk of um, just being identified as CAFAG uh, within the community, we wouldn't organize um, a workshop. So we have other alternatives. We have key informant interviews that are conducted by caseworkers who are already following those children. Uh, to uh, to maybe document a few things, but uh, indeed, like these are the risk of being identified. The other risk is of um, you know telling again your stories and then thinking about what happened and so on. So we um, we are mitigating this risk as much as we can. And then in so one of the first strategy is that we don't ask any personal question. We never ask. Why did you why did you join this on group? Like, how did you feel about this? Like, that's we never ask this kind of question. We always ask questions in very general terms. So, for example, like, do you know why boys and girls join this on groups? Like, what are the reasons? Why could we do to prevent it? And so it's you know so the way we frame questions so we mitigate the risk of of telling, of disclosure of their personal stories and, and maybe disclosure of abuse. 
We have also caseworkers who are present in the room to handle um, maybe signs of distress if, if they may occur. So we have all this, you know, like a kind of safety net that is put around the children within this workshop so that, um, um, so that we mitigate the risk. Facilitators are also trained to identify the signs of distress and immediately like change the session. So there are alternatives to the sessions. We said that this session is potentially sensitive. Here is an alternative on how you can do it. You know, so um, these are some of the measures we have in the toolkit. That's great, Sandra. Thank you very much. Um, I think there's a lot of cross learning that um, you know comes out of this session, and I will let I will move on to the Sharon now before commenting too much. But I can just see you know how um, you know there's there's so many linkages and there's so many also um, spaces that should be explored further to really see how you know um, you know the program experience that you have for example can also feed into um, you know like a, a more like high you know policy checklist and vice versa now I will ask Sharon to talk and I hope that maybe you will be able to, to talk a little bit more about the Nairobi process and uh, because that also really, really links to how to ensure um, uh, participation of children and we know that this participation needs to be um, first of all safe right and uh, um, involve um, clear uh, mitigation measures so uh, my question for you Sharon actually was um, if uh, if you could tell us a bit more about um, the correlation that you see between accountability and the prevention of grave violations so um, yes over to you Okay, well, that's a lot to fit in uh, with also connecting it to everybody and the Nairobi process. And <laughs> in about four minutes. <laughs> yes, only four minutes. Okay, uh, well, if I, if I could, just to be, you know, responsive to what we're talking about here, and how what we're working on connects with what our colleagues are doing here, because you're saying that there's a lot of overlap. And I just wanted to identify, you know, that here so others maybe can also join us. This is how we make it work in the long term, right? Um, I think what we're what we're talking about is, um, well, we have the mediation, we have the Nairobi process. The Nairobi process especially is, is one of our uh, reactions to the, um, all of the reintegration work that we've done as co-chair of the Global Coalition for Reintegration of Child Soldiers. Um, and uh, this was something we wanted to get the voices of children in. Now, to be clear, and I think Sandra's made a really good point, um, if you're dealing with children, those under 18, you need to have child protection specialists doing that. So in our Nairobi process, because we're also looking at the arc of reintegration, so we have people from Sierra Leone that are part of this, for example, um, we are saying nobody under 18, unless you have a, uh, uh, somebody on staff that is a child protection uh, trained specialist. And I think only one of our partners has that. So everybody else is 18 and above. Um, and what we're doing too, and I think this is something else that Sandra highlighted, is we're not asking for their stories. Don't tell us you know, what happened to you when you were in the groups or anything, but really uh, we did this, we were re recommending the same thing, which is if, what would you tell um, decision makers that children need, um, you, know, uh, you know, maybe based on your experience or maybe just based on your own logic, what do you think to help children that come after you, what should reintegration look like? Um, and so that's what we're doing there. So we're putting in the role of experts and not victims. And when we invite them, and we're gonna have about, hopefully, this is the plan now, about 10 coming from each of these countries to join us in Nairobi to present, uh, to workshop amongst themselves and then present their recommendations is uh, we're calling them our guest experts because that's the role that we wanna put them in. Um, and I think it's um, I, I think it's good on many levels, but I won't go into that now. But I, it definitely fits in with what Sandra's team is doing, and and a checklist as well. This ticks a few boxes. What we're hoping happens after Nairobi is to have a um, a broad um, group that we can all uh, talk to, and this joins into the different initiatives. Anyways, um, but you know, also in the mediation guidance, which is what I was here to uh, talk about as well is another tool in our toolbox uh, for accountability, certainly. 
um, but also accountability towards prevention, right? This is why we do it. Um, we are um, in, we've opened a, a hub of my unit in uh, Doha. And from there, we're going to be rolling out this guidance um, at a regional and or national level. We have, we're still putting that plan together, but this is something we'd welcome your feedback and input into as well, is where can this be, um, you know, cause right now it's at the 30,000 feet. How can we put the ladder between that and a national process or a local process? Are there groups of mediators, you know, so we're, we're looking at all of that uh, because we also see that as an accountability, certainly accountability measure and one that's going to need a lot of support to ensure that it's uh, implemented. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sharon. Um, I know the time wasn't much, but you've been able to tie in um, a lot of the other um, topics as well. So thanks for that. Um, um, we, uh, we don't have much time, but we do have time for a couple of questions. So um, I've seen that Jonah um, had a uh, previously written this from the moment when I think you, um, Sharon, presented. So I assume the, the question is directed at you. I'll read it and I will leave you um, some minutes to reply. So um, he's asking, how are you engaging with countries with high risk to reducing conflict impacts to children? And um, Yes, I mean, others, the other speakers are also welcome to um, to reply, but um, I know that it was asked to during um, Sharon's presentation. So over to you, Sharon. Uh, yes, I mean, that is, you know, part of a, a prevention approach. And because um, resolution, as you know, our, our, our mandate is guided by, uh, we're mandated by the General Assembly, but uh, the frame of much of our work comes out of Security Council resolutions. So we have 13 of those. And the last one was 2427 in 2018. And that one urged us to engage more in a preventive way with member states, uh, which we have been doing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we've made statements on emerging conflicts. Um, there's behind the scenes engagement often, uh, discussion with, with member states. We're also looking at ways in which maybe we can work at a regional level since many of these conflicts are cross-border and have a regional element to them. Um, so in terms of countries that are high risk, uh, we do try to engage, but we also rely on the UN partners that are on the ground. But there's, uh, you know, if countries are not yet on our agenda, then, you know, we don't have as much of a, a footprint as OHCHR, as UNICEF, UNHCR, uh, OCHA, others that are on the ground who are, you know, our, our mandate is very sharp and narrow. We have a very small office and a very high level boss. Uh, and so the idea is to catalyze and organize and amplify at the ground level. So that's really what we do. We get information uh, and we work together engaging um, the UN system as a whole. And of course, also always with NGOs. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and I don't know if the other speakers wanted to um, jump in on this um, and add anything from their perspective. Um, and if not, I'll just uh, read the next question. Please let me know. Sure, if you don't mind. Sandra, I hope I'm not um, jumping in. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to add so our unique approach at the Delaire Institute is working directly with security sector. And so when we're talking about high risk environments, one of the main approaches we have to accountability and prevention is uh, capacity building and pairing trained trainers with our colleagues in different contexts. And that's been a very effective model for us to have, for example, some of our strongest uh, trained trainers coming from Sierra Leone who have lived and experienced recruitment of children um, directly helping contexts where there is high risk as well so that hope and that um, coming through to the other side of a conflict is very important in addition to their skills and their training capabilities so pairing people who are interested in collaborative learning skills development and behavior change has been really important to our work in high-risk environments and then secondly we also have our early warning system 
that we're developing right now. So we're looking at trying to understand high risk environments before they become high risk for recruitment and enabling a process to, to begin much earlier than we've been accustomed to responding in the past so that we're able to prevent recruitment and other atrocities well before they're manifesting. So this is an important and new capability that we're in the, in the process of, of really enhancing as well. Thank you so much for that and uh, for adding on, um, you know, the Dallaire um, Institute's experience and uh, expertise as well. Um, so I'm very much um, very happy to hear this. And I don't know if Sandra, if it seems to be fair that you might want to um, step in as well, uh, or um, we can also look at the other question, which I've um, which is a bit more programmatic. It is quite um, quite a big question. I don't actually know if we've got time to answer it like, um, and to give it justice, but we could try uh, maybe in a minute and then we're gonna have to um, give the last pieces of information and wrap up um, for the day, for the session, not for the day. <laughs> um, any thoughts or would you like me to maybe read you the other question, which was more directed um, at you? Uh, he says, it would be interesting to understand how prevention and reintegration programming are taking into consideration um, context of protective crisis and conflict or fragile settings. Now, I say that Sandra can reply, obviously all speakers could, but um, just for fairness, um, I would just let Sandra go ahead. Yeah, so thanks. A very big question indeed. Yes. Um, there is no easy answer, obviously. But indeed, this is something that we see in a lot of contexts, and it's one of the reasons why there is recruitment, why there is conflict in the first place and a lot of places, because there are no resources, people feel abandoned, and you have armed groups coming, surfing on this uh, feeling of loneliness, of abandonment from the government, and then encouraging people to take weapons and fight for their rights. So we see that in most places, uh, not only in protracted uh, crisis, and, and this is actually in the toolkit, you will see this is part of the strategy for both prevention and reintegration to not look only at, you know, case management and how we can work around the child and his family, but also looking at things more broadly and having a more holistic approach. And this is where engaging other sectors, and I was in this session earlier on multi-sector approach, and this is where this is very important. Child protection actors alone cannot, cannot address this. And this is where we need the sector of education, the sector of justice, the sector of wash and food and security, everyone around the table say, let's you know, work with this population, give them services. And we know like this, we will contribute to the prevention and to the reintegration of children. So easier to say than to do, <laughs> but that's the... That's the strategy we encourage, and um, and yes, that is also present in the in the toolkit. Thank you, Sandra. Um, yeah, I give you a huge question to answer to. Um, but um, your answer, um, you know, and the fact that um, there will be uh, a need to to have like a whole session or multiple to really um, delve into the details and see how. Um, uh, just brings me to the next point, which is also the my wrap up point, uh, which is to actually lead our um, participants towards one of the um, news that um, associated to the CAFA task force, which is the community of practice. And I would uh, invite um, people to uh, to really join. Um, the community of practice on CAFA, which is part of the larger um, child protection in humanitarian action community of practice. It's hosted in, by, um, uh, in a platform called Changemakers for Children, and we have shared here. Um, for those who would like to, um, to become members, please note that there is like a double registration, so you'll need to register first to the CPHA community and then to the um, CAFA um, uh, group. But um, it is a very, um, well, we're trying to still like 
stimulated and stimulate more discussion, but a question like the one asked by Zaudi um, could definitely um, um, trigger a lot of um, um, interesting um, chats, I think. So um, we, uh, we also use it to uh, post news about upcoming events and uh, upcoming resources. Um, so yes, a little bit of publicity for, for our CAFA task force, Sandra. And uh, we have one minute left. So I would like to say um, really thank you to, to the speakers. Um, it's been very interesting. Um, as always, the time is never enough to really discuss everything we would like to discuss, but I'm sure that um, the audience and participants today really enjoyed it and I certainly did. And um, I know that uh, um, there's, um, someone something I had to do which is to ask you to please leave any feedback on the session um, and also if you um, would like to uh, write a couple of takeaways for the session please follow the mentee um, in the chat box other than this um, we're up to time thank you very much and uh, goodbye everyone thank you just before you go, this is David. I'm one of your uh, producers. Thank you very much indeed, Giovanna, and all of the panelists for making this session so valuable, such important work that all of you are doing. Um, as Giovanna mentioned, you'll see a link to a Mentimeter survey where you can uh, put your share your, your takeaways. I've also shared a link for a survey that we're doing on the session itself. So please do follow that Survey Monkey survey. And finally, I'm going to share uh, a link to uh, a reminder, rather, a reminder that uh, we would invite you to revisit the Philo pages uh, where you will uh, have a chance to take part in the infographic discussion sessions that will be happening there. And also find your way from the Philo welcome page to Wheelo, which is your virtual coffee uh, room where you can meet fellow speakers and attendees from the conference. So we hope that you found this session very, very helpful indeed, and we look forward to hearing your feedback. Have a lovely afternoon, morning, evening, or whatever it might be for you. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you, David. Thanks everybody. Thank, thank you, especially to Gio. Thank you, Camilla. Thanks to the producers. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.